Excuse me. Hello, Colin. How are you today? Good, Dewey. How about yourself? I'm good. Can you hear me? I'm good. Okay. Um, yeah, so I can you can hear, hear me if you can answer. So that's good. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. I'm I'm the talking fish. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I like it. I need to get I need to get a picture of myself. Um, so people know it's me. I know they can see my name, but um, <laughs> but I've been using Zoom for. so long now and if i haven't changed it i probably never will so yeah where are you coming from dewey if you don't mind me asking no i don't mind i'm i'm in seattle oh nice okay excellent yeah yeah how about you i was just i was just in seattle uh oh cool. for for, for posit comp so um which was really cool um yeah. where are you located uh, i'm from lincoln nebraska so oh, right in the, the middle, middle of the country <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So that's excellent. Um, I'm going to give everybody maybe like a, like a minute or so. I know we had like 20 plus last time. So yeah, I want to make sure I give people some more time to walk in. I know uh, one of the more popular kind of data science community things are for data science. No, the data science hangouts like right before. right before this so i'm sure there's some people that are in that that are going to transition over here so i see yeah so we'll give it a couple more minutes or we'll give it a minute or so and then we'll kind of get started yeah and and you know colin i'm uh i'm uh leading next week uh yeah i jumped on the first one excellent <laughs> so we'll be we'll be our noobs together or the other folks and me but um we just use the Should I plan on just using the slides from the header? Is that what most people do? Yeah, I mean, uh, I've, yeah, use the slides. I mean, if you want to modify them for whatever you, like, if you feel like you want to add something, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, okay. If you're not as comfortable with um, how to change those, I'm more than happy to walk you through that. Because um, you can do it locally and then you can make changes. You can do it locally and then submit your changes if you want. Sure. So, um, but yeah, it's up to you. Um, yeah, don't worry about being new. I mean, we'll, we got a whole community of people here to help out. So a lot of brain trust of people that yeah. use R or have used R. So, right. um, yeah, I've definitely done programming a lot. I program all the time, but it's just not in R. So it's, uh, it's, uh, <laughs> just getting used to the syntax and the quirks, like any new language. Yeah, there's definitely some quirks. Um, I can say that some of them are nice and some of them are kind of yeah. like, you got to kind of get over it. So, um, excellent. Uh, I think I want to give people a couple more minutes to come in. So, um, I did want to welcome everybody again. I got to do this start thing for John. So let me get this going. Start. Start. So I just want to welcome everybody to, uh, the R for data science review and discussion for cohort number 11. We're going to be discussing uh, part of what we missed last week and then go into chapter number one of the whole game, which is data visualization. And so we're gonna go from there. But before we do that, uh, I wanna do some kind of admin things here real quick, kind of cover uh, what, let me see if I can share my screen here. So desktop one. Here. So can everybody see my browser? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, just some admin things. Obviously, we're going to cover chapter one, data visualization. I will be covering this, um, leading the discussion. Dewey and I have been kind of talking a little bit. He's going to lead next week, which is going to be workflow and basics. So we'll be looking forward to that. Um, 
So just want to give a heads up. We only have two more chapters that need to be taken. So we have chapter number six, which is workflow scripts and projects and getting help. So if anybody wants to jump on these, go ahead, because it seems like they're going fast. I did also want to mention, because somebody asked um, why there's only eight chapters that are covered here right now. Uh, the community is kind of exploring different options to see how to best facilitate this large book. It is a very large commitment to do all 30, 35 chapters and are almost 30 chapters in one go. So what John, the geek who manages the community is going to do is he's going to kind of play around with like doing like sections of the book and see if like, okay, if this time doesn't work anymore for people because life happens, work commitments change, so on and so forth, the time might change based on the blocks. So um, that's why we only have eight right now. There is, we want to do more, obviously, we're going to plan on doing more. But just for right now, this is the first block, we'll do the next block, so on and so forth. So we will commit to doing it for cohort 11. But we're just going to have like checkpoints to make sure that we know, hey, is this still a good time? So uh, before we start talking about what we kind of have to finish up for last week and getting into chapter number one, what questions do the group have or any kind of things that I can clarify for anybody? And I should be monitoring the chat. I'm going to try my best. No, nope, I don't want to do that. Where's my Zoom chat? All right, I don't think there's any questions. And again, um, if you feel free to jump in at any time. Don't be afraid to you know, uh, jump in and ask a question while you're in here. If you want to go off mute, happy to do that. If you want to go through the formality of raising your hand, you can do that too, but I'm pretty loose of how things will run. So, all right, cool. Let's talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we just want to kind of cover a couple of things that I wanted to highlight from last week that we, that we didn't get to. And this one's a really, really important one. It's installing packages. Um, if you, there are packages that are preloaded when you kick off an R session. Uh, most of them are going to be from base R. But most of the tools and the functions that we're going to use in R4DS are going to come from what's called the tidyverse, which is a universe of packages. And so for you to be able to use those tools, you have to bring those in. Um, well, you first have to install them and then bring them in and into your R session. And so to install them on your computer, you're just going to have to do install.packages and then call tidyverse. This is the most general convention of how to bring how to install packages onto your system. There are other ways to do it, but this is most this is the most general way that most people do it. Uh, in addition to that, when you want to use these packages in an R session, you have to use library and call the specific actual library itself. What's nice about this is that there is generally an error that happens if you don't have the package on your system. R will push an error to say, hey, you don't have the specific package. You probably need to install it. You just run install that packages and it will install the package on your system. Okay. So it's a good thing to see this error because if you see this error, it usually just means, hey, you don't have the package loaded. So or installed, not loaded. We can talk a little bit more about the difference between installing packages and um, using library to attach them into your R session. But the best way I kind of explain it is think about your phone, right? So think about the apps that you have on your phone. When you want to have a specific app on your phone, what you have to do is you have to literally go out to the app store, whether that be the iPhone app store or the Google app store, and then actually install the app onto your phone, right? And so that's like the install.packages. For you to actually use the app while on your phone, you have to click on it to actually kick it off. That's like library, whatever, library notes, library calendar, whatever you're doing on your phone. So for people that are new to this, just know there's a difference between installing and running library to actually use the functions and use what the package has available to you. Also know that if you shut down R, you close R, you close R studio and you kick it back off, you'll have to kick off whatever libraries you want again by calling library such and such. There's ways to um, there's ways to make this a little bit more efficient, but for right now, just know that if you shut down R and open it back up, 
you will have to call library this. You won't always have to do install the packages though. You just don't. Um, I'm not gonna cover the convention stuff. Uh, you can read that on your own, but there are some resources for help. I just want to highlight these. Many of you are aware of these. You are a part of the data science learning community. So this is a great place. So you can kind of look at these on your own, but I do want to talk about a little bit about reproducible examples. If you need help with something, reproducible examples are the best way to get help. Um, I'm not going to dig too much into what a reproducible example is because we can spend an entire session talking about these. But really what you want to do is you want to create an example that other people can run on their computer. Because if they can run it on their computer, they're going to be able to better help you to solve, okay, what are the issues that are happening? Now, there are certain steps that you have to do to make sure you do that. You have to provide some example data. You have to at least provide what you've tried and then describe what you're trying to do. But the takeaway basically here is, is that if you have an issue with something, it's best, especially in this community, to put a reproducible example together because people are going to be better able to help you out. Um, there are resources out there that can help you do this. There's a package called Reprex, which can help you do that. And there's, and I'll share in the chat later, I'll share later. There's a, there's a lot of posts out there to discuss how to create a reproducible example. So um, those are the two things that I wanted to highlight from last week that we didn't get to, but I think they're important things, um, especially because, you know, where do you get help? the most important thing installing packages and, and loading in packages are a really important skill to have and you're gonna do it a lot. So it's just something to kind of have foundationally. Okay. Before we move on to data visualization, what questions do people have about installing packages? What questions do people have about reproducible examples? All right, cool. Okay, um, let's see here. So let's start talking about data visualization. So like I mentioned last week, this book is really, really good because it gets you started off with um, getting into the code and actually creating something rather than starting with like programming concepts and all the different things that you can do in R. It just starts with something that's very useful, data visualization. And so what we're gonna do today is we're gonna strive to produce a simple plot this one on the right, using a package called ggplot2, which is part of the tidyverse. In addition to that, we're also gonna learn how to use different aesthetics, AES, um, and mapping, or aesthetic mappings and geom functions to produce different types of plots. We're also gonna focus on distributions and how do we visualize distributions and relationships. And then we're also gonna talk about this concept of small multiples, also known as faceting. And what we're going to do is we're going to try and strive to give you at least enough information for you to create this plot here using the Palmer Penguins data set, which we'll talk about here in a second. So that's where we're going uh, for today. So I do see a question uh, about installing packages from D. She asked, do you always need the latest version of R to install pack a package? Um, that there's... You don't necessarily need it, no. So the, the simple answer is no, and it also, it depends, right? It's always, well, it's context specific. It's always generally for most people that are beginning, it's always best to have the most updated version of R. It just is. Um, but there are certain situations depending on certain contexts where you will want to use an older version of R, but it, it like like Bolivar said, it it depends. And so, um, I don't know, Bolivar, if you want to expand on that, you're more than welcome to. But the yeah. simple answer is no, so, but it depends. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, say say you were giving a data set in a R script, an old R script, and you're trying to reproduce those results. Uh, it's usually best to kind of use the packages and the R script uh, that was used at the time and that if the people did a good job they documented that information and you have that that possibility of that uh and i imagine we're going to get into like using ramp and reproducible environments but uh yeah if you're uh just starting analysis now yeah with the uh, coolest most uh, updated stuff but if you're trying to reproduce scientific paper or some analysis, uh, 
you can you can you might have to use an older version or some packages you, and are not haven't been maintained and are not compatible with a new version of ours you have to kind of uh use an older one yeah absolutely thank thanks for the extra context with that um yeah I, it really <laughs> it goes back to it depends it depends on your situation if you're trying to work in a reproducible environment or you're trying to reproduce things then you might have to take this into consideration but for my people that are just starting out like if that was like if that went over your head, don't worry, just have the latest version of R and you can learn and pick up those skills later to use older versions to um, improve reproducibility. So excellent. Uh, okay, so I already kind of talked about loading in packages, so I don't think I need to talk about this again. Um, but again, we're using the tidyverse. The tidyverse is a collection of packages. And in fact, when you run library tidyverse, which you're gonna see, is it's going to give you some information in your console of what uh, what packages are actually being brought in. And in addition to it, there is going to give you some information on what um, is being conflicted or what conflicting functions uh, the tidyverse is going to mask. So to think about this a little bit, there is, so there is a base R package called stats that has this function called filter. Well, dplyr also has this function called filter as well. And so what happens is, is when you write, when you bring in tidyverse into this, it's going to mask filter. So when you call filter, it's gonna to refer to dplyr rather than what is like the stats, which is stats, which is a base R package. Um, you can get around this. One way to do this is to do what's called double colon notation in your code. So if you want to use the base R filter, what you have to do is you have to do stats colon colon filter. And if you want to use the dplyr one, you could be very explicit and go dplyr colon colon filter. Um, this is this is important only when you have conflicting um, conflicting issues with this. When you first start out, you may not have too many too many issues with what's conflicting, but as you start to grow your package knowledge and you start to bring in more packages into your session, conflicts are going to be more of an issue. And so there are some packages out there. I think the package is called conflicted or conflict R. I can't remember. Somebody can put it in the chat or jump in. But there is a package to help you see, okay, what functions are actually being masked by what specific packages. But tidyverse is nice to us. Yep, conflicted. Thanks. Um, it just is very explicit to say, hey, if you bring in the tidyverse right now, this is what's being masked. So, and, so today, oh Colin? yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. And, yeah, and does it does it always um, does it always by default mask when you bring in like if you were to bring in another one that had filter after tidyverse, would it mask the dplyr one? Yep, I think the it's latest one is the one that's meh, takes yep, precedence. Absolutely. Okay. Yep, absolutely. So like if I bring tidyverse up, like just here for this example, like say Palmer Penguins had a function similar to one in GG themes, the GG themes one will override or mask whatever's in Palmer Penguins. So okay, it's goes from the top to bottom. If you do run into that situation, it's best just to do the, the double colon notation in your code. So later on, if you know you want to use a specific function from a specific package, it's just good to use that double colon notation. Do you always need to do that? No, it's just, you don't have to be explicit, but like there is that masking issue, right? There's a lot of similar things that you do in an analysis that you're going to do across many different contexts, right? Filter is a pretty common thing, right? So it's going to have, you're going to have those kind of masking things. So, but good point. Yep. Uh, okay. Excellent. Um, so we're going to use these two packages. We're going to use Palmer Penguins. We're going to use GG Themes. You're going to have to install both of these on your own. Uh, Palmer Penguins and GG Themes are not a part of the Tidyverse. They're separate packages. So you'll, you'll have to install those on your own. So let's talk a little bit about Palmer Penguins. So Palmer Penguins is its main, its main purpose is like a, a, a data set from an academic study of penguins in Antarctica. Um, there's more specifics about it, but this is kind of a nice data set. It has some really kind of straightforward kind of measurements, variables, and um, different observations that we can use. 
it is part of this package here called Peng or Palmer Penguins. And the data set that we're going to use is Penguins. And you're going to notice that this is not a function. This is an actually an object that is stored in the Palmer Penguins data set. And so because this is not a function, we don't use those parentheses to actually call it. And so you can kind of, what's nice about Palmer Penguins, it's a tibble, which we'll talk more about this data structure. I think there's a, a chapter that talks specifically about this, but a tibble is a nice uh, is a nice data object to work with in R because it gives you additional information beyond just what's like the data set itself. So it gives you information about the number of rows and columns. So in this penguins data set, there's 344 rows and eight columns. In addition to that, it gives you information about what the column names are. And then it also gives you information about the types. So species, island are factors, bill length are doubles, uh, filter length millimeters is int, so on and so forth. So it gives you additional information about this, gives you a preview, and then it says, hey, there's 334 additional rows in this. Oh, and I also didn't print out all the other variables in the preview, which is sex and year, and then these are the types. So we'll talk more about tibbles, but they're a very convenient data structure that gives you additional information about the data set you're working with. And in fact, what's really, really nice about this is there is a question in, or there's an exercise that asks you to ask like, how many rows and columns are there? Well, if you're working in a tibble data structure, it gives you the information at the top, which is really nice. So, all right. So let's talk a little bit about ggplot. So we're using ggplot, the package ggplot2. Um, it has this function called ggplot. ggplot is the initial setup function to create a data visualization. Now, within ggplot, there are two arguments or parameters. Some people refer to them as parameters, but I'm going to refer to them arguments here. There's an argument called data, and there's an argument called mapping. Okay. Data should be pretty intuitive, right? It's the data that we're going to use. And in our case, we're going to use penguins. Okay, so we're going to use penguins. And mapping might be not as familiar, but mapping basically is saying, okay, what variables do you want to use from your data set within this plot? That's basically what it's doing. And so the result of this is going to be this plot right here. Now, you might be saying, well, Colin, there isn't any data here like what's going on like i'm not seeing anything you say you're putting in flipper mm you say body mass g but what's happening is here is just ggplot is just basically setting up the graphics object for us and so now that we have this graphics object what we can do is we can tell ggplot okay i want you to manipulate the data using some geometry and so what we're going to do is we're going to use geom functions to create layers on top of each other in our plot, okay? So before we start talking about geomes, what questions do people have about just kind of this, the general setting up the graphics device using ggplot? Hi. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Perla, I, yeah. I, I'm just guessing that the default settings include uh, all these numbers in the x's, the uh, I mean the x and y. I I I mean the, uh, six thousand. I mean going from two thousand to six thousand, and then in the x, going from one hundred and seven to exactly. This is by default. I'm guessing. Uh, it's not by default. It's taking the values within penguins and it's making, you know, it's simply it's making an educated guess on what the range is going to be for the axes. So, I mean, your range of your values could be zero to, you know, essentially infinity if you wanted to. But ggplot is, ggplot2 is smart enough to figure out, okay, what is a good enough range to represent this data? And you have the ability, there are additional functions which we'll talk about that are available in ggplot that can help you like set the specific range or modify it. 
So I would just kind of modify the language a little bit. It's not a default, but it uses the values in the variables to figure out, okay, what's what's good enough to include the data within the plot? Okay. Does that answer you your much. question? Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, and right now I'm not going to dig too much into it, but it's, it's, it's kind of like magic, right? <laughs> it's magic that it can do that. It can look at those values and figure out, okay, what's a, what's a relatively decent range to include these values. Okay. But great question. Excellent question. Um, so there was a question. So somebody, so there was a question about defaults and like what arguments are available. If here's kind of like a tip for you, and I'm going to bring in our studio here. If you're ever kind of wondering like what arguments are, um, let me clear my console here. If you're ever interested in what arguments are available for a specific function, you can use this function called args and you can run the actual function in it and it will output the actual arguments. And so you can see, and I'm sorry that my default settings are kind of making this a little bit um, light and I'm not gonna change them right now for the sake of time, but you can see these are the parameters or arguments that are a part of the ggplot function. And on top of it, you can see what are the defaults, which are kind of nice. Now this won't work for every function, but if you have a function that has arguments or parameters, you can run args to see, okay, what are the arguments of this function? Again, it doesn't work for everything because there's another concept that we're not gonna talk about here. But if you're like, I don't know what the default arguments are, you can just run args on it and then take a look at it. Um, yeah. If you, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Dewey. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, if folks haven't haven't used the question mark GG plot in in the console there, that like, I think I've already done it like five times in <laughs> in this session alone to to just check check out things that you're typing because it, uh, yeah, this is this gives you a lot of information about the function and how to use it. Uh, it can be a little techy, but it's uh, it's quite good. Yeah, um, and I was going to talk about this here in a second, um, the question marks, but thank you for bringing this up. But uh, most of the tidyverse functions that we have, they're going to have associated documentation with them. And what's nice about this, and we'll just talk about it now. Um, yep, and two, Austin brings up a really good point. You can also put your cursor over the specific functions and hit F1 in RStudio, and it's it's a little bit faster. So thank you for that little efficiency tip. But um most or yeah, all of the tidyverse functions will have really good documentation and it's worth reading it and looking it over. I also want to give you, well, let's talk a little bit more. There's also another thing called vignettes that are available as well. Um, but yes, this is a good tip. If you want the official documentation attached to the function, do question mark this. This is also great for Palmer penguins too, or for penguins penguins, which is our data set that we're working with. Um, this is an object that also has documentation associated with it. And this is another answer to the exercises. There's additional information about what this data set represents and some more information about the source itself. So um, these are great examples of, of packages that have great documentation. I will say that there are some other packages that are out there that don't have as good of documentation, but that's one benefit of using the tidyverse is the documentation is really, really excellent. And that's why I'm an advocate of using it. So yeah, actually, yep. And you can actually look at the source code too, if you want to. Um, so Bolivar had a tip in there is if you want to look at the source code, you sure can um, definitely check out those functionalities as well. So let me go back here. Okay, cool. All right. So moving on from there, let's talk about GMs a little bit. So we kind of, ggplot was smart enough to kind of set up the graphics objects for us. Now we want to say, okay, how do you, what, what shape do you want your data to take? And to create the shape of your data, you're going to use these functions called geom. And one example of this is geom point, which allows us to create a scatter plot. Um, there are common geoms for most of the common data visual visualizations you want to create. So if you want to create a bar chart or shape your data using a bar chart, you'll use geom bar. If you want to use a line chart, geom line. If you want to create a histogram, geom histogram, or geom hist, no histogram, excuse me. And we'll talk about those here later, but there are all kinds of geoms that will manipulate the shape of your data. In our case here, we want to create a scatter plot, so we just use geom point. One thing that I want to highlight here is this warning. Um, 
the best way I've had it put to me was, um, is that warnings aren't necessarily a bad thing. Um, warnings are things that are just information for you to look into further. So if you see this warning, it's not necessarily mean like your code's broken or something's wrong. It's just giving you information to say, hey, there might be something wrong. You want to look into it further. Errors are errors, right? It means something's not working. You need to fix this. So errors are very clear. Warnings are, hey, there might be something wrong. Look into this a little bit further. And then there's another thing called messages, but I'm not going to talk about that. But some functions will push out a message. Message more is just like giving you information. So if you see this warning, this doesn't necessarily mean that there's something wrong. It's just something that you want to look into further. And in our case here, there's actually missing values or missing very or missing values within our data set. And I'll bring this back over so you can kind of see it because I already have it prompted up. Sorry. Um, you can see that there's missing data here on row number four. And so it's just basically saying like, ggplot's going to be explicit and say like, hey, you have missing data. You might want to, you might want to adjust this or you might want to fix it. So, but it's never going to not work because you don't have it. Let's geoms. Um, so as part of this too, we also have aesthetics. We have ways or visual properties that we can manipulate for the plot itself. And there's many different types of aesthetic mappings out there. And I'm not going to cover most of these. You can kind of dig more. I'm going to point you to a specific documentation out there that helps you kind of better understand uh, what these are. But the main ones that you're going to first start working out with is just X and Y, right? In a two-dimensional plot, what variable do you want to put on the X? What variable do you want to put on the Y? Like, those are the ones that you're going to want to know. Um, these are just going to be further ones that you might use to add variables to or more kind of like static values to kind of manipulate or manipulate your plot. I'm not going to dig too much in, into this, but there is, let me see, vignettes. Oh, I can't remember. There's a, there's a vignette from ggplot2 that will talk specifically about, um, you know, let's go points. There's a, there's a thing called a vignette, and I'm going to get it up here so you can see it. But vignettes are additional documentation that are added to plots that talk more about um, that talk more about what's available. So let me pull this up here. Uh, okay, bring it over. Okay, yep. So this is a vignette. Um, if you want to kind of read more about this, there's a vignette called ggplot2 specs. This will give you all of the description of the different aesthetic things that you can change within the plot. So say you're doing like a geom line and you want a different type of line, you can change it, right? You can change it to solid, dash, da 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 You can do line width changes. You can do all kinds of very customized things. You can change the different symbols, so on and so forth. But I want to highlight here that your aesthetic mappings, although there are a lot of them, they're beneficial because they give you the ability to be hyper customized in what you're creating. And so it takes some time to get familiar with these, but I guess the kind of takeaway is this is just be familiar that you have these available to you and you can read more about them and reference them and figure out how to use them to create the plot that you want. Okay. So what we're going to do here is we're actually going to explicitly um, change color and what we're going to do is we're going to map on a variable of our data set species to color. And so all of this is the same. We're going to take our data penguins, our mapping, which is our X and our Y, which is going to be flipper body mass. So that makes sense. X is going to be flipper length in millimeters and body mass in grams. And what we're going to do is, is we're going to take color, which is our color aesthetic and apply the variable species to it, which is a categorical. There's three different species that are, um, observed in this data set, um, Adelaide, Chinstrap, and Gentoo. And basically what we're doing is we're saying, hey, apply a color to each one of these individual species. And ggplot does that for us. So you can put um, many different values within color. You can use a more continuous variable as well. That will just be some type of gradient color. Um, but you can do all different kinds of things. But the takeaway here is, is that you have all of these aesthetics that can change different things, so.
I knew I just throw a lot. I just threw a lot at people here in, in about a two minute discussion. Um, I will say that we are going to dig more in depth in this. So if you're like, wow, this is a lot, we will have like, I think three or four chapters that are going to dig into this even further. So um, if it's not quite sinking in just yet, don't worry. We'll, we'll come back to these concepts again. So, but um, what questions do people have before we start talking about adding layers to our plot? Yeah, Trevin, thank you for adding like the cheat sheet is really good. If you have a chance, pause it, it has a pause at the company that puts that makes our studio available. Uh, they have a really good cheat sheet for ggplot2 that is very helpful. Yep. Um, okay, let's move on. All right, so let's talk about adding layers. So like I mentioned before, because we've set up our graphic object, what we can do is we can start adding layers. We can start adding geomes to our layers. And so say in addition to this, we want to add some type of model or some linear model to this or some line of best fit for each individual species. What we can do is all this is the same, but we just add this plus here and we just add this function called geom smooth called method LM. Okay. Method LM is just saying linear model. It's referencing a linear model. There is a default geom smooth does not default to a linear model. There's many different that are available to you. But what we get now is not only do we get our graphics object, our layer of our points, the colors of our points, but now we get an individual line of best fit for every single species in our data set. Um, really nice, really simple. We just have to add this extra layer of Geom Smooth and it's smart enough to do this. Um, there's many different fun geome functions that are out there. Like I mentioned before, you can dig more into these, but some more common ones are point, line, smooth, histogram, box plot, map. If you're using some type of plot that you're used to seeing or using, more than likely there's a geome associated with it. Um, in fact, I'm not gonna search for it right now, but there is in the ggplot2 documentation, there is some more information about like all the different geomes that are available to you. But again, we're gonna talk more about this in depth. So. I'm not gonna spend too much time about different geomes, but main concept here is you're just creating layers. You're just adding layers to your graphics object, okay? So let's talk about global versus local aesthetics. So there's this difference between global and local. So within ggplot2, you can specify things globally in your ggplot function. So here in our mapping, we have aesthetic, we're saying X, Y, and color but we can also drop some of these down into our specific geome function calls. And so say instead of this, instead of creating this linear model or line of best fit for each individual species, say we just want one line of best fit across all species. To do that, what we have to do is we have to drop our aesthetic down into our specific local place where we wanna do this. And in our case, we're gonna pass the mapping into um, the geom point. So the difference here is in this one, we're doing it globally. We're adding it to our mapping aesthetic function here, color. But then what we're doing is we're dropping down our aesthetic into our geom point, okay? I'm trying to think about how to best explain this, but I think it's, it's clear here that that's what it's doing, right? Here we're saying, just pass this species down to all of these things. And then here, because we specify it here in geom point, we're just saying, hey, only pass it down and create one for species here. Or don't drop down species into the geom smooth. Excuse me, I said that incorrectly. Don't drop the aesthetic mapping into geom smooth. Just only create it here in the geom point. That's probably a better and more clear way to say that. So, um, what questions do people have about global versus local? Yeah, I suppose, you know, this is Dewey again. Yeah. Just, um, it's not immediately intuitive to me, like uh, where you would drop, drop that color species to, like uh, if you had multiple things chained here, that, and you had a bunch of aesthetics up in the global, 
Like, where would you stop dropping it <laughs> before you said, okay, now I'm good. And, and how does it impact the subsequent ones? You know, I like just intuitively to me, I didn't know that saying an aesthetic of color equals species at the point level would make my smooth be one line instead of two lines. I don't know. That's not, I don't know. It's just not inherently intuitive to me, but maybe, it, maybe there's something I'm missing. No, that's a good point. So let me clarify this. So I said drop. Um, that's probably not the best way to say it. It's more like, where is it passing that information, right? So if we put color here, what it's going to do is it's going to pass this specification of species down into these two functions or these two layers. So I think pass is a better verb. Uh. Here, what we're basically saying is, okay, color is no longer here in the mapping. So it doesn't pass it to each of these geome point, geome smooth. But if we specify it here in geome point, it's only a part of that specific layer. Does that make sense? Oh, I see. So so things in the global apply to everything down below and things in the local only apply to local. That's the key difference because uh, that, 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 I see. That's, that's, uh, that was very helpful because that's why geo smooth now changes because the the color species doesn't apply to geo smooth because it wasn't passed down from global inherited yeah. from global or, or number of words you could use for that but yeah so, sounds good yeah there's a i think pass is a better word um if you're coming from more of a computer science background inherit is probably another way to put it i mean there's many different ways to explain this um drop was probably a poor way to say it because I was thinking about how the code was organized rather than how the actual code works. Yeah, and yeah. It wasn't clear to me that like in the in the locals, yeah, in the in the subsequent ones, local doesn't up doesn't inherit down below, just global inherits. So that yeah. that's that's a that's a key distinction. Yeah. And it's and it goes back to that idea of the grammar of graphics, which we really didn't talk too much much, but Hadley wrote a Hadley Wickham, who is kind of one of the uh, one of the main core developers of some of these tidyverse packages. He wrote the grammar of graphics and it's an academic paper. And if you want to read more about it, it's linked here, but it really talks about that concept of layering, right? Like we're just adding layers to our plot. And so we just keep adding layers, keep adding layers. And that's where geoms come in. It's just, we're adding those layers and we're telling those layers, what do we want them to specifically do? Or we just want to say, Hey, globally, just pass all these things to all the layers. So, excellent, good. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad we, I'm glad we could clear that up. Uh, okay, so improving accessibility. Um, so a big thing to consider is about who your audience is and thinking about their needs in regards to being able to um, get the information that you're trying to pass to them, and that comes with colors. And so there are different extensions and ways to manipulate the colors in here. Uh, in our, for us, we're going to use this function called scale color colorblind, which is a convenience function, which just automatically sets the colors in a palette for people that may have um, a colorblind. Um, might require some different ways to represent the colors. And so that's all we do is we just basically, this is all the same of what we've been doing. And we just add the plus, add this convenient function, and then we do this. I don't want to dig too much into it here, but ggplot, because you have the ability to do hyper customization of this, you can control many different aspects of the palette. I mean, you can go as wild as you want with as many different colors or different kind of colors. And if you want to do neon, you sure could do neon. Um, it's available to you. Um, but just the big thing here is, is that if you just want something simple to manipulate the palette to make it accessible to everybody, there's this convenience function called scale color colorblind and it will automatically set the palette for you. So uh, why stop there? Uh, I mean, you can go even further. So you can add another layer. Another layer that we could add to this is more information in the regards of like a title, a subtitle, or manipulating the different um, X, Y, and then the different titles for um, the legend itself. The function that we use here is called labs. And labs has all of these different arguments. They should be pretty intuitive, title, subtitle, X, color, shape, Y. And we just pass a string of what we want to pass in there. String being text data inside of quotations, double or single quotes. So you can see body mass flipper length here 
is the title, subtitle, dimension, so on here. You can manipulate all of these. Um, there's also another thing called a caption. So if you want to add source information here, you sure can. Um, it's just the argument called caption and you pass a text string into caption and it will show up right here. That was one of the answers to the exercises. So I'm kind of covering the exercises while we're going through this, but that was one kind of thing that was kind of covered is, hey, that's what you do. You take the arguments in labs and pass it there. You can also get hyper customized in what this actually looks like. We're not going to talk about it here, but there is a function called theme, which allows you to like change the boldness, change it to italic, change the weight, um, change the size, change the font type. Um, so again, ggplot is very um, is very good at giving you the ability to manipulate whatever you want in the plot. So. Plus labs, um, I think we covered most of the stuff that the exercises wanted to cover, um, especially with how do you get information um, about objects? How do you get information about your data set? Um, we've already kind of talked about some of these concepts of creating like different things. So just for the sake of time, I don't think I'm gonna cover all of these, but there are answers in here that if you're like, I got kind of stuck, the answers here are really, really good um, to help you out with it. I think it covered most of it. Oh, this one's good. And then this kind of number 10 is really good to kind of check yourself. And I'm not going to show it here. And I, I suggest you look at it. Really look at these two and ask yourself if they're the same or different. And this goes back to our conversation versus global versus local. Um, and the answer might be a little surprising to you, even if you do understand that idea of global and local aesthetic mappings. Um, I'm not going to, I'm not going to ruin the spoiler alert. Um, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to give a spoiler. You can kind of read into this, but really, if you kind of understand what's going on here, you'll, I think you'll understand the concept of global versus local. So, okay. So let's talk about ggplot2 um, calls. Um, R is great because you don't, R is, some of these are, R is really great because in functions, you don't always have to be explicit in the parameters or the arguments that you're using within your functions. So what's nice about this is you can shorten your call of these arguments or pass things into arguments positionally rather than explicitly. So before what we were doing is like in ggplot, we were doing data equals penguins, mapping equals aesthetic or aesthetic mappings. What we can do is we can simplify this by just saying pass data, pass in our mapping, so on and so forth. Now, it's on you as the developer, you're gonna have to understand, like this is a convenience, you're gonna have to kind of understand what is the order of these arguments. Because if you are gonna use this convenience, you have to understand, oh, ggplot is data first, then mapping, then whatever else you have. What's also nice is aesthetic is its own function as well, so you can make this even more succinct by taking out X and taking out Y and just go flipper length, comma, body mass G. Now, I, I sometimes more error on the side or I kind of go towards more of being explicit rather than um, being explicit rather than implicit. So it's, it's up to you as a developer and how you want to develop your code. You know, uh, I've gotten into the realm of just getting rid of some of these, these calls to the arguments, but just know that there's that convenience. And so it's usually good as you start learning, it's just like, learn the first couple within the function itself, right? ggplot, the first thing's always gonna be the data call. It just always is. And so if you kind of know that, then you don't have to do data equals. And two, there has been a big push in tidyverse across all of the different packages and all the functions within those packages to kind of follow that kind of general um, design where it's like data comes first, then like more commonly used arguments. And so it's just kind of good to know that because a lot of these conventions translate not only here from ggplot2, but to other tidyverse functions. So um, this, is, this is kind of a, a I know people that come from different languages, this is kind of eye-opening sometimes that you can do this in R. Um, so I'm gonna give an opportunity for people to ask any questions or what questions do people have in regards to this kind of convenience that's allowed to or available to you. Yeah, I mean, I think it. I think it's nice. Um, I think uh, someone new um, 
as you said, can get uh, can get their code twisted up pretty quickly by not having uh, the parameters in the right order. And they're trying to figure out why it's not working. And the error message you're getting is obscure and you can't figure out why <laughs> and you think you got it right. <laughs> so that's that's the danger, right? Until you're comfortable with the arguments. I do want to highlight for anybody that is coming that is new to R, um, in the documentation for most of these functions, there's going to be a section called arguments. And the arguments are going to list out what the actual arguments are. And in addition to it, there's a section called usage. And usage will label out all of the different parameters and, and in what order they're available. Yeah, and um, their default values, which is critical. Yep, and their default values as well. So if you're somebody new and, and this is like, oh, this is great, Colin, the convenience is great. But like Dewey said, you can kind of get messed up really, really quickly. It's good to just go look at the documentation, look at this usage section, and then the argument section because it will list out the actual like what they call the application or the API or the application programming interface of the function itself, um, and then you can kind of get a better sense of it. Um, but that's one thing to look at, and it's just it just takes time. You just have to learn it. I, I mean, I wish there was an easier way to do it, but um, you just got to learn it. Is the way I look at it. Yeah, and Colin. Yeah. Yeah, back on that back on that last screen. Yeah, sure. Let me go back. Just uh, that that dot 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 implies that the the four above can repeat. Is that correct? Or what? Tell me about dot 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 there. <laughs> okay, absolutely. Um, so this is going to be kind of a more advanced topic. So this function might wrap other functions. So what this does is is basically saying, oh, in addition to you can pass function. Uh, or excuse me, pass arguments to those functions that this wraps is basically what it is. So um, I'm trying to think of a good example of this, um, but basically it's just allowing, it just extends this function to, for you to pass additional arguments to functions that this function might wrap. Hmm. Okay. I, 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 I realize what I just said is really abstract yeah. But if you're somebody new that's coming from this, don't worry about this. We'll talk more about this. But the dot, dot, dot just allows you to pass additional arguments to later things. Yeah. Right? That, that can uh, be transferred, especially with uh, not geomes, but uh, stats, which ggplot has, where you're like calculating or scaling something and it gets passed and you want to calculate the mean or you want to do a logarithmic scale, it passes to the basic like stats functions that R uses. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I didn't mean to do derail us. I can I can sort of pl play with that a little bit. It's almost like it's uh passing to <laughs> To functions that it overloads in in other language uh, uh, terminology, but I'll I'll take a peek at it and see. I, I've seen that before for for the simple functions like Bolivar mentions and mean and stuff that I've done some work with already. Um, it felt more like a repeater, but it it's clearly not a repeater. So I need to understand it a little bit more. Yeah, and I can pass some more information if people want to dig into this. Um... For, for, for our people that are coming at this new and, and are new to programming, don't worry about the dot, dot, dot. This is a, is, it's a really advanced topic that um, you'll, you'll come across later and you don't need to worry about it too much. So, um, but yeah, I think that's an excellent question, uh, Dewey. I think that's an excellent question. I'm glad you brought that up because it is available and it's one of those, I'm going to admit, I've done, been doing this for a while. The dot, dot, dot is one of those kind of interesting things that R makes available to people that I still probably don't fully understand. So yeah, there. And and especially it's confusing. Like when you look at what you're, what's on the screen there, it says other arguments and not currently used. And you're like, uh, well, I guess I shouldn't look at it at all. <laughs> <laughs> well, some, some, yeah, some don't pass, but I think it, it allows you to extend it. Right. So like right, in right, the design exactly. of it, it allows you to extend it. And so, yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's an advanced topic. Um, <laughs> I think we can spend more time on it, but I think um, let's just move on from there, and we can pass some more information in the Slack for sure. It's one of those things where like I still have trouble with it. So, um, okay, so 
let's just kind of go through some of these quickly. Like if you want to create bar plots, you sure can. You just, it's just different genome. Um, you'll notice that here, I, an important point that I wanted to highlight here was, is that you only have to supply one aesthetic mapping, which is species, because ggplot and geome bar actually does the calculation for you in the background. So you don't have to count this up. Now, there are ways to um, change this. So if you want to be very explicit in your calculations and how you want to represent this, you sure can. There's a way to do that in Geome Bar. But if you're just somebody that wants a quick bar plot and offload the calculation to ggplot, you sure can. Uh, distributions, you can use histograms, uh, Geome Histogram. Again, it only requires one aesthetic mapping, which is your X. And what's what... What to be aware of with Geome Histogram is this argument called bin width. Bin width is just changing how many values are in your specific bins. So in our case, we're saying take 200, put them in there, and then it just changes the how it visually represents the um, histogram. You have to play around with it. I'm sure there's probably some algorithms that somebody smarter than me has figured out how to calculate this properly, but um, I've just kind of defaulted to playing around with it and see what gives you a good representation of your data. I know probably my statistician friends that are on this call will probably be like, that's probably not the right way to do it. It's just the way I do it. <laughs> so, and a lot of people do. Um, and then if you don't necessarily like this, you can also rely on geome density, which is the same data, but what it does is it uses a function to basically smooth out your distribution. So, you're getting a different set of information, but it's a, you have the same information represented in a different way. And it just creates this kind of smooth line to kind of better represent the distribution that you have. So geome density is available to you. Um, I'm starting to realize that I don't think we're gonna get through all of this. Um, you can read through more of some of these exercises. I think the one that was um, kind of eye-opening is this idea about geome bar and passing in aesthetics out, or passing in mappings outside of the aesthetics. So if you wanted to, you could change different colors, but this one isn't as intuitive. So with bar plots, if you pass color equals red, it's actually the outline of the bars. So you actually have to use this aesthetic called fill to actually get what you want if you're looking to fill the bar. So there's some quirkiness in regards to setting some of these more default like setting these, setting these um, arguments like with just like static values. Um, so you just got to be kind of more aware of them. Uh, I don't think there's really anything else out of here. I do have to say that this one's a good one to play around with if you want to figure out how to kind of experiment with um, like bin widths. The uh, diamonds data set is really interesting to play around with to kind of see like manipulating the bin widths and experimenting with them. So. Okay, uh, I don't, visualizing relationships. Yeah, I think this is probably a good stopping point because we're already at like the six minute mark and I do have a hard stop at one. Um, so I think we could probably finish the next, the last part of this probably, probably the first like 10 minutes of next time. Um, but Dewey, you'll be up. So make sure you're ready for number two for workflow basics because we'll get into that um, after I kind of finish this stuff. But I'm going to open it up with the last three minutes I have. What, what questions do people have that I can answer? Yeah, and workflow basics is pretty short. So it seems we shouldn't have any trouble, I wouldn't think. Yeah, most of these are just like, hey, if you have different variables, do this, do this. Or if you're looking at different variable, you know, look at this. And so I think we'll go through this pretty quickly. But excellent. Uh, what other questions do people have? Does ggplot have a geome for means with confidence intervals? I've only seen box plots. That was a great question. Um, I know box plots are available. Uh, I'm going to lean on the group. Does anybody have any suggestions for Eva here in regards to that question in the chat? Does ggplot have a geome for means with confidence intervals? Uh, as in a box plot with means or like a bar with means and confidence intervals? Mm. Yeah, you can. I've, I've done it by calculating the mean 
itself. So in a violin plot, I don't have an example right now. You calculate the mean and then you draw that mean like that line. And somehow, you know, also calculate the confidence intervals manually and then you kind of, but it's like, basically taking a violin plot or a box plot and customizing as much as you can. Right, or you could take the data and apply those summary functions the summary, to data yeah, you, into new columns and then then plot those columns, right? Something like that? Yeah, there's... Um, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I have done it uh, using uh, two different geoms. So geom point to catch the mean and there's another called a geom error bar. So there are two different layers, but they they are drawn in the same place. So one one geom for the point and another geom for the error bar. So geom error bar and geom point. Well, that's yeah, great. I, I, I've, sorry, I've used error bar. I think always you have to think if you're trying to show standard error or like standard no. deviation, like no. all that stuff. Cause I, I don't remember which one's the default, but but it's like needs to be double checked depending on, on what you want to achieve or want to represent. I don't want to jump in here real quick, but I'm going to leave the group open. Y'all can continue your conversation. I have a hard stop at one, but the Zoom will stay up. So if you want to continue this conversation, that's great. Um, I just have a hard stop here at one o'clock. So I really appreciate everybody joining in. If someone would please remember to, in the chat, just put STOP for me, because John needs that for this. But yeah, you're welcome to continue this conversation. I just have this hard stop at one o'clock and I really appreciate seeing everybody. So um, I'll see you next week. So you, thank you, Colin. Thanks, Colin. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you guys for your feedback. I'll try the the point and the error bar. That's basically what I'm looking for is something to show means and and errors. No. But so. by all plots are always more informative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the but, box but... plots are great, but it's a different, you know, it's it's a different visualization. And I don't necessarily that's not usually what I'm looking for. So Okay. But it's called Geom Point and Geom Error Bar. Okay, I'll give so, it a try. And with the argument, you can select so SA, SE for a standard error or CI for confidence interval Perfect. inside the, the geometry right. bar. You know? Okay, excellent. Yeah, I'll give that a try. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Okay. Bye, guys.